why all the concern about the deficit? You've heard of them, you've seen some of the numbers, but let's drive it home here. Right before the recession, we had a deficit of $455 billion. That was the highest deficit in dollar terms we'd ever had in this country. And then the deficit tripled to $1.4 trillion. Now, it went down a little last year to $1.3 trillion because repayments under the TARP program were higher than expected. But we now know this year the deficit will go to an all-time high of $1.6 trillion. Now, a lot of that's because of the tax compromise last year. That equates to 11% of GDP. That's the highest percentage we've seen since the end of World War II. This is a staggering deficit. <clears throat> You know, I look at these numbers, I'm reminded that the first Treasury Secretary of the United States, Alexander Hamilton, started the U.S. Treasury with zero dollars. And I'm pretty sure that's the closest we've ever come to breaking even at this point. <laughs> well, when people look at these numbers, they say, well, what we need to do is move out of the recession. Once we move out of the recession, businesses will make more money, individuals will make more money, tax revenues will go up, we'll work our way out of this problem. It's not so clear. That deficit panel, again, bipartisan congressional members said, our nation is on an unsustainable fiscal path. Even after the economy recovers, federal spending is projected to increase faster than revenues. Now that sentence may take you by surprise. It says that even when we start seeing more tax revenues, expenses are growing at a faster pace. We can't keep up. So what we obviously have to do then is cut government spending, cut down on some of those expenses. Well, that's not so easy either. Many of you have seen this chart. This is updated with this year's numbers. At the top of the chart is what the federal government will spend this year, $3.8 trillion. Sixty percent almost of that are mandatory entitlement programs. Now, for this purpose, entitlements are garden variety entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. We can't change that spending unless we change the laws that govern those programs. 5% is interest on the federal debt. Anybody want to guess what's going to happen to that in the years ahead? The White House will tell you it will quadruple in the next decade. And 24% is defense. The president has said we're out of Iraq. We're going more forcefully into Afghanistan. To date, no one has been seriously suggesting until very recently reducing defense spending. Well, you add those up, you have 87% of all spending that either can't be changed or won't be changed. Well, that leaves 13% domestic spending. That's courthouses, government buildings, national parks, government agencies like Amtrak, Center for Disease Control, Homeland Security. Let's be tough. Let's agree in this room we're going to slash that spending by a third, make every agency take a third less money. Well, a third of 13% is about 4%. 4% of $3.8 trillion in total spending is $150 billion. A lot of money to save, but it won't make a dent in a $1.6 trillion deficit. The Republicans said, you elect us to Congress, we will immediately slash spending by $100 billion. Good for them won't make a difference with a $1.6 trillion deficit. And when you look at this, you realize why. It's the entitlement spending, the Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid that have to be addressed. Let me nail that point with one more statistic. What do you think the federal government spends on entitlement, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid? Well, you just saw the chart, $3.8 trillion in total spending, 58% is entitlements, $2.2 trillion on entitlement spending. What do you think the total federal tax revenues are? How much money from all sources comes into the federal government? Well, $3.8 trillion in spending, less a $1.6 trillion deficit. Total revenues are $2.2 trillion. We spend every tax dollar on Social Security Medicare and Medicaid. We finance two wars, every government agency, social programs, and stimulus by borrowing money. This is not a sustainable situation. Yes, revenues will increase as we move out of the recession. So will entitlement costs as the baby boomers age and life expectancy increases. This is why the panel found expenses increase faster than revenues. It's not that we buy too many locomotives for Amtrak. It's the baby boomers are aging and the entitlement costs are going up. Well, what do we do? 
You're going to hear a lot of talk in the coming months around three major areas, spending cuts, entitlement reform, and tax reform. Now, spending cuts are the easiest, and they're the first up. And there's a growing consensus that we're going to have to cut not just discretionary spending, but defense spending. The Secretary of Defense says he's prepared to cut the Pentagon budget by $80 billion. Keep in mind, he was appointed by a Republican president. And also the Republican leaders in Congress are now willing to cut some defense spending. So that's step one. Step two is harder, and that's entitlement reform. Entitlement reform is hard because you have two contending constituencies. And it's not the Republicans and the Democrats, or even the affluent versus the middle class. The first constituency are all of you, all the people who are working. And when I tell you you're going to have to pay more to support those people in retirement, you're going to say, why would I do that? There's not going to be anything left for me when I get to that age. And the second constituency are all the people who are near retirement or in retirement who are going to say, I worked my whole life for these benefits. How can you take them away? And we're going to have to do something that takes a pound of flesh from both of those people. So the proposals being considered on the Medicare side start with more cost sharing. If you're on Medicare and you go see the doctor, you're going to have some skin in the game. Don't you love that expression there? And that means you're going to have a copay. And that means if you're wealthy, your copay is going to be more than if you're in the middle class. We're ultimately, I believe, finally going to settle on tort reform so doctors are not paying those big damages. And we're going to have to contain the growth in federal health care spending. If GDP goes up by 2%, spending can't go up by more than 2%. On Social Security, we're going to do the three things that I've been talking about for years. The first is higher taxes. Right now, as I said at the beginning, we all pay Social Security tax on about the first $100,000 we earn. There's no need for that cap. That cap is antiquated. It's regressive. The panel would raise it to 200,000, it could go to 300,000. Now you see the perversity of the tax compromise last year. We all need to be putting more money into Social Security, and yet this year we're putting less money in so we have more money in our pockets. I believe we'll push back the retirement age from 67 to 69 is the proposal, it may go to 70. And I believe we will means test benefits, which means you get your benefits in retirement only if your income is below a certain amount. Social security becomes like welfare. Now I'm looking out there, I can see you're getting angry about this point. You're thinking, wait a second, that's my money. I put the money in the system. I gotta get the money out of the system. Ah, but it's not your money. And you know how I know it's not your money? Because the government has spent that money. That's the whole problem here. So I think we're gonna do some means testing. Now I do think we'll have generous grandfathering for people about 55 and older. You'll get your full benefits, you'll get them on time. But as you're doing retirement projections for clients under about the age of 55, I'm not sure I would include Social Security. The system can't sustain those payouts. And the third element and the hardest is tax reform. Hearings are gonna start next week on proposals to get rid of deductions, get rid of credits and exemptions, and drive down the tax rate low, perhaps as low as 23%, and then apply that tax burden more evenly across the income levels, so that we don't just simply raise taxes on the affluent when we need money, we raise it across the board. Last year, 45% of American families paid no income tax, not a dollar of income tax. Last year, 48% of American families received some sort of payment from the federal government. Think about that. 55% of Americans pay taxes, 48% of Americans receive a payment. Now there's some overlap, people on Social Security might do both, but you see the transference, we can't have that. There has to be a system where everybody is paying, and I think we are gonna move in that direction. But keep in mind, no matter what your income level, you will be paying more dollars into the federal government. Mathematically, the deficit demands that more dollars come in. Now this is hard. The way we put it is tax simplification is complicated stuff. Or actually, to quote my favorite law professor, Homer Simpson. <laughs> Homer Simpson said, and this is a direct quote, I started to work on a flat tax proposal and I accidentally proved there is no God. It's hard, and it's gonna take a while. But I do think that ultimately is where we're going. Now at this point, you're probably thinking, why did Merrill Lynch invite this guy in? He's on drugs. I mean, my gosh, these guys in Washington can't look at a clock and decide what time it is. How are they gonna deal with entitlement reform and tax reform? 
My concern is if we don't move up on this, it will be forced on us. And it will be forced on us by the purchasers of our national debt. At some point, China says, we're not going to keep buying at the same rate because we have some concerns about the fiscal situation. They're not going to dump debt. They're not going to throw us into crisis. They just will slow their rate of purchases. And our first reaction will be to raise interest rates to get them to keep buying. Well, that's not a good thing for the economy, and it's not a good thing for the deficit because we have to pay higher interest. And then if we still don't fix it, at some point China says we're just going to hold back some of that money and invest it elsewhere. And that causes a problem. It causes a problem because we can't finance the government. Now, if you think this is far-fetched, it's already happened. A few weeks ago, the International Monetary Fund issued a report chastising the United States on the state of our budget deficit. That's a report they give to third world countries. They gave it to us this year. At the same time, Moody's issued a report downgrading the debt of Japan. And in that report, they said, we want to see some movement in the United States on the deficit, or we're going to have to come back and start thinking about the credit rating on treasuries. Now, don't get nervous. We're not going to lose our AAA rating on treasuries. No Democrat, no Republican will allow that to happen. They've made that clear. Secretary Geithner has said so explicitly. But that is the kind of forcing event, what I call a forcing event, that makes Congress start thinking about this, a drumbeat that they may have to worry about the rating on treasuries, some suggestion that China may peel back. Those are the kind of events that I think will force us to finally address this. We can't say when, but we have to believe it will happen. Now, when you think about it, this is exactly what's happened in Greece and elsewhere in Europe. Creditors said, we're just going to stop purchasing as much of your debt. Now, we're not Greece. We're not Ireland. They had a lot of more entitlements, much lower revenue, much shorter fuse. But it's the same kind of issue. Now, here's the way the deficit panel put it. Large debt will put America at risk by exposing it to foreign creditors. In a worst-case scenario, investors could lose confidence our nation is able to repay its loans, triggering a debt crisis that would force the government to implement austerity measures. The contagion of debt that began in Greece and continues to sweep through Europe shows us no economy will be immune. If the U.S. does not put its house in order, the reckoning will be sure and the devastation severe.